Welcome to BBC News. I'm Rajat Ahmed. Our top stories. President Trump claims the attack on two tankers in the Gulf of Oman has Iran written all over it. Iran denies the claims. The World Health Organization says it's deeply concerned about the ongoing Ebola outbreak in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Emergency teams in Chile try to locate three miners trapped 70 meters below ground after a landslide. Days of heavy rain across southern China leave dozens dead, with tens of thousands forced from their homes. And it's paradise for a paleontologist. We go fossil hunting in search of the mysterious and monstrous megalodon. Hello and welcome. Well, President Trump has dismissed Iran's insistence it had no involvement with the attacks on two tankers in an important oil route in the Gulf of Amman. Earlier, the US military released a video which it says shows Iranian special forces removing an unexploded mine from one of the ships. Tehran has flatly denied being behind the attacks on Thursday. They believe that other powers are trying to provoke trouble. Here's our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette. America builds its case. The U.S. military says their video shows Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards removing a limpet mine from this stricken tanker. Their photos of the ship's hull points to what they say is probably that mine which didn't explode and the damage from one which did. One of two attacks on oil tankers in the Gulf on Thursday, which rang the alarm about disruption of oil supplies and the danger of war in this volatile region. Others, including the UN, are calling for an investigation. Yeah, we'll have a but this morning, today. President yeah, Trump took to his favorite uh, TV show to good, say Iran's to blame. Well, Iran did do it, and you know they did it because you saw the boat. I guess one of the mines didn't explode, and it's probably got essentially Iran written all over it. Tonight, Britain's foreign secretary backed him up. Jeremy Hunt now says responsibility almost certainly lies with Iran. Iran denies that. At this regional meeting, its president took aim at the United States. The U.S. government has acted against all international laws in the last two years by adopting an aggressive policy and it has posed a serious threat to regional and international stability. Whoever caused these explosions knows they're playing with fire. Just look at this map of the Gulf region and the narrow waterways where the world's oil tankers come and go. This is where these tensions could escalate by an accidental collision or a retaliatory strike by Iran or the U.S. and its closest partners, including Saudi Arabia. For now, the Saudis are threatening stern action against what they see as Iran's puppet, the Houthis in Yemen already locked in a devastating war with the Saudi-led coalition just south of here. So is there a way out? Definitely, and that's through diplomacy. The Trump administration pulled out of the nuclear agreement last year and reimposed sanctions on Iran despite the fact it didn't violate the nuclear agreement. Now we have people in the administration that are hoping to put so much of an economic pain on the society that lead to a regime change. And so, and at the same time, they're saying that they want the Trump, that they want to talk to Iran, that they, um, they call me, and, and so that, that's almost laughable. If Iran's to blame, it may be its message. It can also inflict pain on oil supplies, on stability. A warning, if one was needed, of the cost of confrontation. Lise Doucette, BBC News. Don't forget, you can keep up to date with all the latest on this story on our website. Uh, you'll find reaction and analysis from around the world, including maps and films and other reports and articles from correspondents based in the region. That's at bbc.com forward slash news or download the BBC News app. And we will, of course, have more analysis later in the program from Washington. Let's get some of the day's other news now. Thousands of Venezuelans have rushed across the border into Peru hours before tough new immigration laws come into force. Venezuelan citizens will now need to produce a valid passport with a visa in order to be allowed into the country. 
A British judge has ruled that Julian Assange will face a five-day U.S. extradition hearing in February next year. The WikiLeaks founder is wanted in the United States on charges of publishing government secrets. Mr. Assange spent seven years inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London before being handed over to British authorities by Ecuador in April. Protests are taking place across Brazil as part of a general strike against pension reform plans. Striking workers have created roadblocks in several major cities, while some public transport has been shut down. It's the first major strike since the far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, took office in January. The World Health Organization says it's deeply concerned about the ongoing Ebola outbreak in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. More than 1,400 people have died there since August, while more cases have been de detected over the border in Uganda this week. Our correspondent Anne Soy is on the Ugandan side of the border and sent this update from Kasese. Well, the people I've spoken to today here in Kasese are very confident that indeed Uganda can control an outbreak of Ebola. They went through a major test this week after the arrival of six family members from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Three of them had Ebola and they did not come in through an official border post. They came in through a back route, but somehow uh, they were detected. Uh, one of the children was very ill. They went to hospital. I've been to that hospital today. Uh, the health workers there were ready. Uh, they have been training for this for months. Uh, they quickly identify the symptoms of uh, Ebola and refer the family to an Ebola treatment unit, which had been set up months in advance. Uganda had trained close to 5,000 health workers in anticipation of a situation like this. However, the problem really is across the border in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, an area that has uh, seen decades of conflict. Uh, there, there are low literacy levels, and the community has been very hostile to the health workers. And they're saying that they still need more international support to bring Ebola, the Ebola outbreak, under control. And soy. Emergency teams in Chile have been trying to locate three miners who became trapped 70 metres below ground after a landslide on Thursday. The miners, who are from Bolivia, have been heard making banging sounds. The copper mine is owned by Chile's state company, Cadelco. Gareth Barlow has more details, and his report contains some flashing images. Rescue teams gather near the entrance of the collapsed mine. 70 metres below them, three Bolivian workers trapped by a landslide. The rescue teams have had contact with the people. They were banging on boxes and the trapped miners responded because they are towards the top of the mine. They are not at the lowest point. With a massive rock blocking the entrance to the shaft, the authorities have resorted to using explosives to try to break it up. We have implemented our Plan A, which sends a signal to the Bolivian citizens that they should retreat so we can start with a series of minor detonations against the rock in hopes of breaking it apart. It's this massive rock which is obstructing the internal channels that would lead us to our workers. Among the three, a father and his son, the third man, 62 years old. Writing on Twitter, the Bolivian president, Evo Morales, spoke of his dismay and offered thanks to the rescuers. In Chile tonight, trapped deep underground, for the three miners, the worst nightmare is a very real reality. Gareth Barlow, BBC News. Days of heavy rain and flooding have hit central and southern parts of China, killing dozens of people. Thousands more have been rescued, with many more evacuated from their homes. Catherine Corelli has this report. This is the extraordinary moment when a landslide hit a road in China's southeastern province of Fujian. Rescue crews managed to free a man who was trapped underneath, but he died on the way to hospital. Days of relentless torrential rain have caused deadly floods, landslides and mudslides across the country. Over 60 people have died. More than 4,000 people have been rescued from floodwaters. Over 20 provinces have been affected, with Guangdong province in the southeast hit particularly badly. Nearly 9,000 homes are thought to have been destroyed by the heavy rain. Millions of hectares of farmland have been damaged by the rain. In some cases, crop fields have been completely submerged underwater. The direct economic loss is estimated to be nearly 3 billion US dollars. During the summer, China routinely suffers from floods in the south. 
But the country's Meteorological Association said that rainfall in two of the affected provinces has hit record highs for June. Catherine Corelli, BBC News. Pope Francis has criticised the world's top energy companies for searching for more fossil fuels, despite the damage they're causing to the climate. He told energy bosses gathered in the Vatican that climate change threatened the future of the human family. Roger Harabin has more. An invitation to meet the Pope at the Vatican is a tough one to reject, even if you're about to be rebuked. The executives were castigated for continuing to seek even more fossil fuels when we've found much more than we can afford to burn while keeping a stable climate. Today's ecological crisis, and especially climate change, threatens the very future of the human family, and this is not an exaggeration. For too long we have collectively failed to listen to the fruits of scientific analysis, and doomsday predictions can no longer be met with irony or disdain. Discussion of climate change and energy transition must be rooted in the best scientific research available today. Representatives of almost all the world's great oil firms were there for addressing down. It is not right that our children and grandchildren pay the cost of our irresponsibility. Among the CEOs was the head of BP. He appreciated the Pope for creating space for this unique dialogue, he said. But he insisted that all sections of society must help tackle this urgent problem. But the pressure was on. Non possiamo permetterci il lusso di aspettare che altri we do not have the luxury of waiting for others to step forward or of prioritizing short-term economic benefits. The climate crisis requires action from us here and now, and the Church is fully committed to doing its part. The Pope posed afterwards with oil executives. Can his moral power succeed where politics has failed? Roger Harabin, BBC News. Stay with us on BBC News still to come. Earth's distant past on display, we head to the new fossil exhibit in Washington that's delighting visitors. This is BBC News, the latest headlines. President Trump says he's convinced that Iran carried out Thursday's attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman. The World Health Organization says an outbreak of Ebola in eastern Congo should not be declared an international emergency. Let's get more on our top story now. President Trump dismissing Iran's assistance that it isn't involved in those oil tanker attacks in the Gulf of Amman. Let's go live to Washington and speak to Mark Canciana, defense expert at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a former colonel in the U.S. Uh, Marines. Mark, thank you so much for your time. First of all, if Iran insists it isn't to blame, why would Iran do this, if only to make the situation worse for itself and to turn other countries that might have been sympathetic towards it against it? Well, Iran might be doing two things. One is they might be uh, making a point to their own population that they are uh, fighting back against the pressure that the United States is putting on them. And the other thing is they may be trying to put pressure on some of the countries around the world that get oil from the Middle East to have them put pressure on the United States to ease uh, some of the sanctions and allow more of uh, their oil uh, to be shipped. But it's an awfully risky game for Iran to play. It is a risky game, but Iran has played this game before. Back in the 1980s, they mined the Persian Gulf. The United States caught them and uh, uh, had some convincing evidence and retaliated and sank a, half the uh, Iranian Navy. So there's some history here. If it isn't Iran, if we just give them the benefit of the doubt for a moment, who else could it be? It's very hard to say. It could well be an Iranian proxy, for example, uh, someone who maybe Iran has been arming but isn't uh, uh, directly uh, 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 controlled by the Iranian government. The Houthis, for example, have uh, done things like this. There's been a discrepancy in the reports as well from, from those who are on the tankers. Uh, some saying they saw rockets instead of mines. I mean, this isn't as straightforward as the U.S. paints it, is it? Well, there's a lot of forensics that need to be done, a lot of statements that need to be taken. 
uh, uh, experts need to look at the damage. Very often, there'll be fragments from the weapons that can be then traced or analyzed. Uh, uh, it, it may take uh, some time. But looking at what we've, uh, uh, the pictures that have been available so far, it's consistent with the lipid mines that people have talked about. A lipid mine is a hand in place, small mine, uh, maybe in place from a small boat. And it looks like that kind of damage has been done. I'm sure you've seen the footage that uh, the U.S. has been talking about of the, uh, you know, what look like uh, people trying to remove a mine from a ship. Does that look like the Iranian Revolutionary Guard to you? D d does it look like any familiar state actor? Well, it certainly would be consistent with the uh, Iranian guards. I mean, they have a lot of small boats in, in that area. Uh, they could have been taking a mine off the ship, but of course, taking a mine off of a ship is not the same as emplacing the mine. So there needs to be a lot of forensics before um, uh, the world community is uh, uh, sure that, in fact, it's, it's Iran that's doing that. And there's a pretty high bar here. There are two things in the background that are on people's minds. One, of course, is the run up to the Iraq War, where the intelligence turned out to be incorrect. And the other one is the beginning of the Vietnam War, where there were uh, incidents in the Tonkin Gulf and the way they were portrayed by Washington turned out to be um, uh, not quite accurate. So with those in mind, I think that there's a high bar for proof in this instance. Where are we headed now? Because there's a lot of animos animosity coming from the U.S. towards Iran and vice versa. It's a very heated situation. What do you see happening next? I think that there's going to be some sort of uh, defensive operation. I could imagine uh, some sort of escorts for ships, some sort of monitoring of the Gulf to make sure that incidents like this don't happen again. Uh, if there's another uh, attack, I think that uh, tensions will rise and that the allies and, uh, will be maybe more willing to uh, take action. I'm very concerned that there might be another attack. There have been uh, two already, and there seems to be perhaps a pattern developing. All right, Mark Cancian, thank you so much for your analysis. All eyes uh, certainly are on what happens next. Happy. Protesters in Hong Kong say they will go out on the streets again this weekend if the government refuses to withdraw a controversial extradition bill. If it became law, it would allow people in the territory to be sent to China for trial. Hundreds of thousands of people were on the streets last weekend, and there were clashes with riot police on Wednesday in the worst unrest there for decades. Our correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes has been talking to some of the protesters. Withdraw the bill. Withdraw the bill. It is the chant that has echoed across Hong Kong this week. Evil police is another. This level of hostility is something new for Hong Kong. The activists are younger, more determined and more prepared to use violence than their predecessors. This young man is yes. one of them. Because He's asked us to hide his identity. Years. We have already know that if we just sat there doing nothing, the, po the government will not listen to us. Even that a few days ago, the one million people protest, the government still did do not think that that, that is a thing. So we believe that we need to use more violent or aggressive ways so that the government would listen to us. These tactics may be working. One senior government advisor today told me he still supports the bill, but the violence means it's time for compromise. So we maintain a different system and we have a different and independent judiciary to deal with these things. And this bill will not enable the things which happen in China happen in Hong Kong. So if it isn't an issue, a legal issue, it is then a political issue. And this is about political discontent. That is exactly the point. So if we were to push ahead the voting on the bill, as we already originally planned, I fear there would be more street violence. It's a long way from the day in 1997 when Hong Kong was handed back to China by Britain. Then many here felt a surge of patriotic pride. 68-year-old Ivy Lai has copies of every Hong Kong newspaper published that day. But 22 years later, she no longer looks at them with any sense of pride. I'm Chinese, 
but I'm not communist. We have become a Chinese colony. That makes me very sad. We thought when we went back to China, we'd be happy. But now, we're more and more unhappy. Some of these young people are now calling for Hong Kong independence. It is a naive fantasy, but it shows how far Beijing has gone in losing the hearts and minds of its Hong Kong citizens. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News, in Hong Kong. Spain's Supreme Court has ruled that a member of a Catalan separatist group cannot take up his post as a member of the European Parliament. Real Junqueras is in prison in Madrid awaiting a ruling on charges of rebellion and sedition for his alleged role in Catalonia's failed independence bid in 2017. Now, where can you meet a T-Rex, a freeze-dried bison and the earliest forms of life on Earth? Jane O'Brien has been on a fossil hunt to find out. This cliff is a cross-section of an ancient seabed and you can see layers of fossil shells up there. Ten million years ago, this part of the Chesapeake Bay was under the ocean. You just find these exquisite fossils just, just sitting here. And for a paleontologist, this is about as close as it gets to paradise. But we're not interested in seashells. Kirk and I are looking for evidence of the megalodon. This is what we're looking for. This animal had a massive bite force. These big sharks were animals that ate whales. Using information gleaned from fossils, scientists have created a life-size model of what they think the megalodon looked like. And millions of years ago, it probably swam right here when the site of the National Museum of Natural History in Washington was part of the seabed. Its return is a bit of a homecoming. And there are other monsters waiting to be discovered in the museum's new fossil hall. The exhibits tell the story of our planet from the first signs of life, through mass extinctions, to the rise and fall of the dinosaurs, and our own age of humans. Just 28,000 years old, this extinct species of bison is one of the youngest fossils in the collection. It doesn't look like the other specimens because it's freeze-dried. We're lucky to have a specimen with uh, such complete structure to it. Um, almost all areas of the body represented and accounted for, including um, some of the original horn material, the skin, the muscle tissue, and some of the fur as well. And like all fossils, it tells scientists a lot about the environment it lived in and the impact of climate change. They were gradual changes that life essentially had time to make adjustments to. What we're seeing in the modern period of climate change is that this climate change is happening very quickly, but the geological record offers us the best evidence as to how life will be able to adapt or not. That's a story still unfolding on the Chesapeake. Hey, check this out. There's oh, you've a got one. A little tiny one. There are lots of different kinds of sharks here, not just the big ones, but just for comparison. <laughs> I'd rather meet that than that. Yeah, no, this is probably some little five foot long shark that's no big deal. This but is, is that the same age? Is that 10 million? Same years? age, same sea, different shark. The megalodon will never return to these waters, but as climate change causes sea levels to rise again, who knows what else may one day emerge from the deep? Jane O'Brien reporting there. Now, before we go. Hello. This weekend isn't looking as wet as it's been, particularly in those areas that have had such a soaking in the past week, but there will still be some rain or showers around. And the reason why low pressure is still close by to the northwest of the British Isles around that, we're seeing weather disturbances moving on through with either some rain at times, very least getting some showers spreading from west to east. So still fairly unsettled this weekend, but it won't be wet all weekend long. There'll be some sunshine occasionally looking fairly breezy this weekend and still not particularly warm, though feeling a little little bit warmer than it has done in the past week. Now, it looks like quite a wet start to Saturday morning in Northern Ireland after rain overnight. It peps up at the end of the night. Some rain too towards western Scotland, Wales and western parts of England. This is that first weather disturbance coming our way, slowly moving eastwards during the day. Any rain tending to become more patchy, showery in nature, but still one or two heavy showers. Ahead of that, two eastern parts, some sunny spells, maybe a shower. Behind it, brightening up and the chance for catching a shower on a breezy Saturday with temperatures close to 20 in the warmest parts of eastern England. Most of us will fall a few degrees short of that.
Now, on through Saturday evening, this first area of showers in eastern England will push away. Looks like we could well see some more coming in towards southwest England and Wales on through Saturday evening, and then pushing a little bit further northwards as we go through the night. Clear spells to the chilliest spots into single figures, maybe towards mid single figures in one or two areas, and in prolonged clear spells overnight. And then on to part two of the weekend. Look familiar? Deja vu, low pressure still to our west. And again, weather disturbances moving around that with showers that at times could be heavy and possibly thundery. We'll start off with a batch of showers close to northern England on Sunday, especially northwest England. Southwest Scotland too, pushing northwards across Scotland as the day goes on. Sunshine, one or two showers elsewhere. And then the potential for some heavier downpours to come into Northern Ireland uh, through the day, maybe into parts of Wales as well. But yes, there'll still be some sunshine occasionally. Not everywhere will be wet, maybe not many showers at all towards East Anglia and the southeast of England, close to 20 in the warm spots. Looks like a similar picture on Monday. Showers, Northern Ireland and Scotland, some heavy. An area of cloud, either patchy rain or a few showers affecting parts of England or Wales. Southeast of that, though, it could well be a little bit warmer into the low 20s. And for many, it will start to feel a bit warmer Monday to Tuesday. Right now, Tuesday is looking mainly dry. So the story of next week's weather is something drier, a bit warmer for a time at the start of the week. I think it looks like it turns wetter again around midweek and then it starts to turn cooler once again as well. This is BBC News, the headlines. President Trump says he's convinced that Iran did carry out Thursday's attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman. Earlier, the US military released a video which it said showed Iranian special forces removing an unexploded mine from one of the stricken ships. Tehran has strongly denied any involvement in the attacks. The World Health Organization says it's deeply concerned about the ongoing Ebola outbreak in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. More than 1,400 people have died there since August, while cases have been detected over the border in Uganda this week. And emergency teams in Chile have been trying to locate three miners who became trapped some 70 metres below ground after a landslide on Thursday. The authorities say they haven't been able to talk to the miners but have heard them making banging sounds. It's 2.30 in the morning, now on BBC News, it's time for the Week in Parliament. Hello there and welcome to the programme. Coming up, as the Conservative leadership race hots up, just how likely is it that Parliament could be suspended to deliver a no-deal Brexit? If we get to a point where a Prime Minister is intent on doing this, the only way of stopping that Prime Minister will be to bring down that Prime Minister's government. We'll be talking to two experts about whether prorogation is a legal or constitutional option. Also on this programme, the government's accused of not going far enough with plans to radically cut greenhouse gas emissions. I do welcome this report, but I'd welcome it a lot more if the government had followed all of the recommendations from the Committee on Climate Change, not just the ones that don't cause it ideological indigestion. And could an ancient Cornish sport resolve the Tory leadership contest? Maybe it's the best way to solve the, the current leadership uh, problems that we've got. You know, maybe the best way of doing it is to put all the contenders into a ring, let them have a massive Royal Rumble and see who comes out on top. But first, the decision about who should be the UK's new Prime Minister and leader of the Conservative Party edged closer in the week. There were 10 candidates in the running when the first round of voting was held on Thursday. And by the end of the day, three had been eliminated. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, later quit the race, with others carrying out frantic lobbying over the weekend. The front-runner, Boris Johnson, scooped up 114 votes, putting him well ahead. In the Commons, opposition MPs were trying to make sure that whoever eventually took the job couldn't take the UK out of the EU without a deal, or as some candidates had suggested, prorogue or suspend Parliament to make that happen. On Wednesday, Labour and the other opposition parties launched an attempt to try to take control of the Commons timetable later in the month, which would give them a day to pass motions restricting the new PM's room for manoeuvre. At Prime Minister's Questions, the SNP's leader brought up the leadership contest and those opposition attempts to take control. 
The fantasy theory stories of the Tory party's candidates are nothing more than an assault on our common sense. And tonight, will she vote to stop any no-deal madness? The motion that is on the table tonight is about whether or not the Government should hand control of business in this House to the Labour Party and the Scottish National Party, and that is something we will not do. In the event that a Prime Minister asks Her Majesty the Queen to prorogue Parliament against the express wishes of a majority of the House of Commons, whose advice would the Queen be obliged to follow, the advice of her Prime Minister or the express will of this House? Everyone knows I will not stand at this dispatch box and speak about decisions that Her Majesty the Queen might make. A short time later, Labour explained what it was trying to do. If the next Prime Minister is foolish enough to try to pursue a no-deal Brexit without gaining the consent of this House, or to prorogue Parliament in order to force through no deal, then Parliament would have the means to prevent that. But the Brexit Secretary warned it set a precedent over who controlled business. One individual MP, together with the Speaker, two members of this House, can override the government business that comes before this House. And that is the effect of this motion. It is putting in the hands of just two members of Parliament the precedence on what how business comes before the House. It strikes me that there are two principles at stake today, one of them being the convention in this House for the government to be able to control the order paper, the other a constitutional principle as to whether the government can prorogue Parliament in pursuit of its policy objectives, with all that means for the Crown and the Crown's involvement in politics. I believe that the latter of those two principles is the weightier one and the one that we should be bearing in mind as we vote today. You know, we will no doubt debate many times in future the, the consequences of no deal, but the, the risks are becoming more and more apparent, and I think we should be grateful to those who are anticipating those dangers and seeking to prevent us getting anywhere near them. Is he saying, on behalf of the Government, Her Majesty's Government, that they accept and agree that a new Prime Minister could prorogue Parliament deliberately in the face of this place persistently voting against leaving without a deal? What I am saying to the Right Honourable Lady is I speak as a Minister on behalf of this Government. Uh, and this Prime Minister has made her position clear in terms of where she and the Cabinet stand on the issue of prorogation. If we get to a point where a Prime Minister is intent on doing this, the only way of stopping that Prime Minister will be to bring down that Prime Minister's government. And I simply have to say here and now, I will not hesitate to do that if that is what is attempted, even if it means my resigning the whip and leaving the party. I will not allow this country to be taken out of the EU on a no-deal Brexit without the approval of this House and, in my view, going back to the country and asking them if that is what they want. But when it came to the vote, MPs backed the government and voted down the attempt to seize control of the parliamentary timetable. The ayes to the right, 298. The noes to the left, 309. <laughs> So, the government saw off that attempt to take over the Commons timetable, which would potentially have given MPs the chance to bind the hands of the new PM and stop no deal or prorogation. Now, prorogation is the way a session of Parliament is ended, sending MPs and peers away from Westminster, usually for just a few days. It's a power exercised by the Queen on the advice of the government, and some MPs fear the new PM could use it to enable no deal by simply keeping them out of the way. So, having failed to take over the Commons timetable to stop that happening, what options do those opposed to no deal have left, and what are the legal implications of all of this? Well, they were questions I put to Barrister Sam Fowles, and first to Jack simpson Caird from the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. I think it's not quite clear what the options are. I think the problem is, is that 
Um, one of the reasons Labour took this opportunity or attempted to take this opportunity to secure more of the parliamentary timetable is that it's not certain that there will be many other opportunities, precisely because um, the running out of opposition days, the days in which there is some time set aside for the opposition to have some parliamentary time, it's not clear whether or not the government will give the opposition any more uh, opposition days between now and an exit day on the 31st of October. So I think that's why there was the sense that they had to act. Let's assume that we do look like we're heading for a no-deal Brexit and we have a Prime Minister who thinks that one of the ways this can be achieved is by proroguing Parliament. At what point do the courts get involved and what could they do? Well... Firstly, there's, the courts will not want to get involved in this. They're, this is not the sort of thing you usually see the courts getting involved in because the, the Constitution is a very delicate balance between Parliament and the courts. And the courts try and give Parliament as much sort of leeway as possible to, uh, to make its own decisions because Parliament's considered sovereign. However, if the, uh, um, if, if the Prime Minister was to try and use his or her own powers to stop Parliament being involved in a decision, then that might be the tipping point. And I think there's two ways the courts might get involved. Of course, the ultimately, prorogue in Parliament is the Queen's job. It's the royal prerogative. But you can review the royal prerogative in some limited st situations. One of these, as was held in, in the Miller case, which was the case that said Parliament had to vote on Article 50, um, and that is to, to review the extent of the power. So you can't say, oh, she's used it in the wrong way, but you can say the power doesn't extend that far. Um, and the other way is to, to look at the Prime Minister's advice and say, is the Prime Minister able to give advice to, to prorogue Parliament? So the question for the courts will be, does the Queen's royal prerogative extend to proroguing Parliament to exclude it from being involved in a major constitutional decision, no deal Brexit, or does the Prime Minister's power extend to advising the Queen to, to do that? If the court decides the power, their powers don't extend that far, then the court may be able to, to say, well, Your Majesty, well, Prime Minister, you've gone too far, you're not allowed to use your power in that way. But would they be able to do that fast enough to stop us heading out of the door on the 31st of October? Well, technically, yes. The courts can act in advance in these situations. They can give an injunction or they can give a ruling in advance. Um, practically, that is very, very difficult. And could the Commons and the Lords, could Parliament pass a law to limit the scope of prerogative powers and therefore stop this proroguing of Parliament in this instance? I think, I think that sort of um, legal instrument is, is possible, is feasible. There, there are other pl plenty of examples where Parliament has passed laws to limit the prerogative power. That's certainly possible. But I think we just come back to this fundamental point that our system depends on shared understandings on core principles, parliamentary sovereignty, the rule of law, separation of powers. And really what we need to work out is whether or not the new Prime Minister will respect those values as much as the previous one did. And Sam, what kind of precedent does all this set? Where does this leave us? Well, I think it, if, if they were to go that far, if they were to be pro-parliaments, then that's a very worrying precedent for a, a, demo, a democratic body. And there's a lot of arguments about, well, we were, you know, that all they'd be doing is, is fulfilling the mandate that was given in the, in the 2016 election. But I think that's actually quite a worrying argument from a, from a sort of first principles perspective as well, because it implies that democracy sort of stopped in, the, in 2016, which of course, of course it didn't. And it's essential to democracy is the, is the right of everyone to change their minds if, if we decide to. We're, we're allowed to be contrary. All right, Jack, last one to you. Of course, the, the other big issue is the clock is ticking. Mm. Parliament is due to go into recess at the end of July. It's quite possible that one way or another, with an extension of something as simple as parliamentary recesses, MPs could be kept away until the end of September. That's a core point. I think the issue of prorogation that people are missing is that ultimately government controls the parliamentary timetable. So I don't think that anyone that really wanted to know a no deal would actually have to resort to prorogation. I think that you could simply just not schedule any opportunities, not schedule any opposition days, as, as, we, as I started out by saying, or um, simply program, programming other business or not sitting on particular days. Ultimately, in our system, the, the executive is largely in control of parliamentary business. And that could very much be the reason that Parliament has limited opportunities to stop no deal. All right, we will wait and see what happens. But for now, Jack Simpson Caird and Sam Fowles, thank you both very much for coming onto the programme. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at some news in brief.
A new bill to allow extradition from Hong Kong to mainland China has led to violent demonstrations. Police fired rubber bullets and tear gas at protesters. The demonstrators feared the law could target political opponents of Beijing, and peers too were worried. In 2018, according to the Wall Street Journal, the courts in China's Jiangsu province acquitted just 43 people while convicting 96,271 and recall how a Hong Kong bookseller imprisoned for eight months in China was told by the authorities, if we say you've committed a crime, you have committed a crime. There was condemnation of protests that have been going on outside Anderton Park Primary School in Birmingham. Some parents say children are too young to learn about LGBT relationships. They also said the lessons contradicted Islam. But peers backed the head teacher. Who has bravely resisted a homophobic, um, what would one call it, a mob who are protesting against some teaching in school. As I understand it, these children are being taught about relationships. But some children have two mummies and some children have two daddies. That's all it is. And if people don't like it, that's the way modern world is. I have utmost admiration for Sarah Clark Hewitson and, um, and, and every sympathy for some of the abuse that she has had to face. Children of four years of age are not taught about gay sex. Children of four years of age are ta taught about relationships and that relationships can look different in different households. A leading Muslim organisation says comments made last summer by the former Foreign Secretary and Tory leadership candidate Boris Johnson about women wearing face veils led to a rise in reports of Islamophobic abuse. Mr Johnson wrote in the Daily Telegraph that women in full face veils should not be banned, but it was absolutely ridiculous that women chose to go around looking like letterboxes. He also compared them to looking like bank robbers. He was later cleared of breaking the Conservatives' code of conduct. Because the words letterboxes and the words bank robbers were used on the street to abuse women wearing headscarves, not only just face veil. And again, that's where I refer back to political leadership comes with responsibility and a huge responsibility. Um, because people will look out to that political reader. People will look out to the words that political leader is using and people eventually will use these words on the ground and on the streets. Um, and we do ask every single candidate that is coming out now in the, in the leadership really to ensure that they work on communities, that they work on addressing issues within communities, but also on being responsible in the language that they use. Sir Lenny Henry says a lack of diversity is undermining public broadcasters and driving people to seek better representation elsewhere. The actor and producer was giving evidence to the House of Lords Communications Committee, which is looking into the place of public service broadcasters in the age of online platforms like Netflix. He had a picture to illustrate who was making programmes. These are all the people that make the programmes for a, a lot of the Netflix outputs, and it's extraordinary. A lot of women, a lot of black and brown people, a lot of Hispanic people. And, and once again, that's why I think the fact that they are being very, the idea of reach of going to that audience, that particular audience saying, you want this programme? We're going to make this programme about the, the exonerated five who were, you know, Ava DuVernay, or we're going to make this programme called Blackish, or we're going to make this programme about whatever. The fact that they can absolutely direct that programme directly at you means that you're going to subscribe and change your viewing habits. It means that people are absolutely deserting terrestrial fare because it's not serving them. So with this representative photograph of everybody involved in making stuff behind the scenes at Netflix, my, my hope one day is to be able to hold up a picture like this for BBC, ITV, channels four and five, and I think that will be a real step forward. The new MP for Peterborough, Lisa Forbes, took her seat in the Commons. She won the by-election by just 683 votes and joins one of the longest sessions of Parliament since the English Civil War. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law. Yeah. Meanwhile, former Labour and Change UK MP Chuka Amuna announced at the end of the week that he was joining the Liberal Democrats. The Streatham MP told The Times he had been wrong to think millions of politically homeless people wanted a new option on the ballot paper.
He was one of six Change UK MPs to quit after it won only 3.4% of the vote in the European elections. Greenhouse gas emissions in the UK are to be cut to almost zero by 2050 under a new government plan to tackle climate change. The business secretary said ministers would legislate to meet the target. There are many issues in this House on which we passionately disagree. But there are moments when we can act together to take the long-term decisions that will shape the future of the world that we leave to our children and our grandchildren. Just over a decade ago, I was the Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change when the Right Honourable Member for Doncaster North secured royal assent for the landmark 2008 Climate Change Act. And I was proud on behalf of my party to speak in support of the first law of its kind in the world, setting a legally binding target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 80% by 2050 relative to 1990 levels. And today I'm proud to stand on this side of the House to propose an amendment to that same Act, which will enable this Parliament to make its own historic commitment to tackling climate change. But Labour said achieving the new target would need huge investment. In its advice, the Climate Change Committee said very specifically that as well as setting the target itself, the government must put in place the policies to meet the target. That means, as they said, a 2030 cut-off date for new petrol and diesel vehicles, not 2040, a proper decarbonisation plan for our 27 million homes, which we don't have, and an end to what I believe is now economically illiterate, frankly, which is a moratorium on onshore wind, given it is now our cheapest fuel available. I do welcome this report, but I'd welcome it a lot more if the government had followed all of the recommendations from the Committee on Climate Change, not just the ones that don't cause it ideological indigestion. In particular, the committee recommended that the emission reduction effort needs to be done here at home, not outsourced to poorer countries. Carbon offsetting basically slows uh, decarbonisation. It deprives poorer countries of the low-hanging fruit that they need in order to meet, meet their own reduction targets. Yeah. So will he review the decision to rely on dodgy loopholes and make sure that the domestic action is all done here at home? Caroline Lucas. Now to Prime Minister's questions, where the Labour leader launched an attack on the government's industrial strategy. Over the course of his six questions, Jeremy Corbyn claimed ministers hadn't done enough to help the steel and motor industries and had failed on renewables. They promised a northern powerhouse. They failed to deliver it. And every northern newspaper is campaigning for this government to power up the north. They promised net zero by 2050, yet they failed on renewables and are missing. And, and Mr. Order, the right honourable gentleman won't be shouted down. It isn't going to happen. Don't waste your breath. It's not productive and it's terribly boring. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, they promised net zero by 2050. Yet they failed on renewables and are missing their climate change targets. They promised an industrial strategy. Output is falling. So which does the Prime Minister see as the biggest industrial failure of a government? The car industry, the steel industry or the renewables industry? Which is it? I just say to the right honourable gentleman, he can pose for his YouTube clip as much as he likes. But, but let's, let's actually look at what this government has delivered. What we have delivered is a racial disparity audit that deals with the inappropriate inequality of public services for people from different communities, record investment in transport infrastructure in the north, a record employment rate, lowest unemployment for 45 years, wages growing faster than inflation, a record cash boost for the NHS, better mental health support, more homes being built, stamp duty cut, higher standards in our schools and leading the world on climate change. Theresa May. Now, what's been happening in the wider world of politics this week? Gary Connor has our countdown. At five. Some say politics is show business for ugly people, but this week Piers debated the soaring cost of West End tickets, with Baroness Flather sharing her theatre tips. The Lehman uh, trilogy. If any of your lordships haven't seen it, 
I would recommend that you go and see it. At four, Westminster Hall was packed on Monday when MPs debated access to cystic fibrosis drugs. So popular, in fact, that a small, furry observer just couldn't keep away. At three, a bad week for Tory leadership hopeful Mark Harper, who failed to win enough votes to stay in the contest. Though you can't say that he ducked the big questions. In a fight, it would be a... A lion or a bear. OK, um, on the basis that the lion is the symbol of Britain, I'm going to save a lion. At two, you know you're getting older when members of the House of Lords are getting younger. The new Lord Ravensdale is just 37 years old and shared some advice he'd been given by the doorkeepers. You're a peer of the realm, my lord. You should bowl in there like you own the place. And at one, celebrations as the oldest living former MP reached yet another birthday milestone. Ron Atkins, first elected for Labour in 1966, turned 103 years old this week. Many happy returns from all of us at BBC Parliament. Gary Connor there. Now, every day in the House of Commons ends with an adjournment debate when a backbencher has the chance to raise an issue and get a reply from a minister. Wednesday night's topic was Cornish wrestling, an ancient sport first recorded in 1139 when it was said to be fought by giants. Championing the cause was the North Cornwall MP Scott Mann. We caught up with him to find out more, but first, here's a taster of the sport, as reported by the BBC's Tonight programme in 1965. Well, that rather nasty bash on the floor that you just saw and heard is technically known as an underheave, one of the six main throws, or hitches as they're called, in Cornish wrestling. Cornish wrestling is the, um, is the oldest sport in the United Kingdom, and uh, it, we refer to it as wrestling in Cornwall, uh, which is the Cornish phrase for wrestling. Uh, it generally competed with men, but uh, we have women's and junior sections. And the objective is to uh, grab hold of each other and to throw each other on your backs to score points. Uh, I want to raise the profile with Sport England. They kindly gave us £8,000 about um, 10 years ago now to, to, to raise the profile of the sport. And that was successful for a period of time. So I'd like Sport England to get involved. And I'm also quite keen to see it feature in some way in the Commonwealth Games. So maybe not in Birmingham, but if we could showcase it in Birmingham, maybe for a future Commonwealth Games. A lot of romantic mythology surrounds these open-air contests. Proud Cornishmen write of the scent of crushed grass on a summer's day. The tense, patient play for a fall. So has Scott Mann taken part himself? I would have loved to. I've been and witnessed it once, uh, but I didn't have an opportunity to take part. Maybe next time that it's on, I'll, I'll be straight in there. And maybe it's the best way to solve the, the current leadership uh, problems that we've got. You know, maybe the best way of doing it is to put all the contenders into a ring, let them have a massive Royal Rumble and see who comes out on top. Scott Mann there on the ancient art of Cornish wrestling. And that's it from me for now. We'll be back with you on BBC Parliament on Monday night at 11. But for now, from me, Alicia McCarthy, goodbye. Hello. This weekend isn't looking as wet as it's been, particularly in those areas that have had such a soaking in the past week, but there will still be some rain or showers around. And the reason why low pressure is still close by to the northwest of the British Isles. Around that, we're seeing weather disturbances moving on through with either some rain at times, at the very least getting some showers spreading from west to east. So still fairly unsettled this weekend, but it won't be wet all weekend long. There'll be some sunshine occasionally, looking fairly breezy this weekend. and still not particularly warm, though feeling a little little bit warmer than it has done in the past week. Now, it looks like quite a wet start to Saturday morning in Northern Ireland after rain overnight. It peps up at the end of the night. Some rain too towards western Scotland, Wales and western parts of England. This is that first weather disturbance coming our way, slowly moving eastwards during the day. Any rain tending to become more patchy, showery in nature, but still one or two heavy showers. Ahead of that, two eastern parts, some sunny spells, maybe a shower. Behind it, brightening up and the chance for catching a shower on a breezy Saturday with temperatures close to 20 in the warmest parts of eastern England. Most of us will fall.